You were a no vote on this yesterday for the same reason we've been talking about for days here, which is that it is without precedent to have an emergency aid bill attached to cuts in funding for something like the IRS. Can you explain your vote a little more? Yeah, I mean, I, I voted no because uh, for a couple of reasons. One, I think I went back in history in time and I was trying to find a situation where emergency aid for an ally or a partner that came about from a crisis was conditioned on cuts to American domestic spending. Um, I could not find that. I think this was an unprecedented suggestion by a very new speaker. Um, and of course, their goal, their stated goal was to cut the deficit. It took about a hot minute to figure out that it wasn't going to cut the deficit in fact, it was going to increase the deficit. Um, so, uh, you know, I just, it was a, a political play there. Uh, secondly, there was no aid for Gaza in that bill. Um, and, you know, we're all watching our screens and where, whatever you think of what's going on, there are situations right now in Gaza that are very dire on food, on water, on, you know, medicine. So I couldn't support that. And then obviously um, the Senate bill is bipartisan. You know, we, we were hoping that um, with everything going on in the Middle East right now, we could have a strong bipartisan and bill that would come over and we'd get, you know, we're, we're still going to look at it. Uh, but what, what happened yesterday was just pure politics from a very new speaker. Congresswoman, good morning. Uh, John Flamir, one of your colleagues, Representative Dingell, was on our air earlier this week talking about some of the politics of this and really raising alarms to the White House and to her Democratic colleagues about the anger that she says she hears from her constituents there in Michigan, uh, from Muslim American voters, from Arab American voters, who feel that the White House and Democratic Party has sided solely with Israel here and is not doing enough to listen to the, the plight of the Palestinians. And we know Michigan, a swing state, margins close. It, she was very concerned it could be trouble for the president next year. Give us your take. What are you hearing from your constituents about this? Yeah, I mean, I don't think you can overstate how um, intense people are feeling back home. Just, again, no matter how you look at this conflict, people are feeling very raw, very emotional. They see themselves, you know, if you're uh, Arab American or Palestinian American or Muslim American, you're looking at, at, you know, the death of civilians. You feel dehumanized. You feel like you're not, you know, a, a first class citizen in your own country because of the administration. And, and so there's a lot of anger there, a lot of uh, death. I mean, you know, we, yes, Yesterday, we had one of our Michigan State fellows who, who was, you know, at Michigan State for a couple of years. He was killed with his family, and the local community knows him. He was a part of this vibrant community. So I don't want anyone to underestimate how this is affecting uh, lots of people, 70,000 Jews in Michigan, over 300,000 Arab and Muslim Americans. Um, and I think that people need to feel heard. So I've been urging the administration to meet with Muslim American groups, like have them to the White House, go and visit, have these conversations. You don't have to do them in public, but allow that voice in the room, because I do think, um, you know, no one should underestimate that intensity and the, the nervousness that people feel. So, uh, so what would you uh, suggest the administration do? I mean, obviously, um, Israel uh, faced a horrific attack. It would be the equivalent of 45, 50,000 Americans being slaughtered uh, uh, if that had happened on September 11th. Obviously, they're going to act. We did the same thing uh, wrongly in Iraq, but also uh, in Afghanistan. I say wrongly. We went in for uh, the wrong reasons. Uh, but you take... <clears throat> You take our battles, um, <clears throat> excuse me, against ISIS and look at a place like Mosul. I mean, that was street to street combat. It was the only way to root out ISIS. Uh, so what what should the Biden administration be telling the Israeli government to do after they lost the equivalent of 45,000 people in, uh, uh, to a terrorist attack? Yeah, well, obviously, this one uh, rings home for me because I, I did, you know, three tours um, alongside the military in Iraq. And so I've seen this up close. I don't think anyone's questioning um, Israel having a right to respond to the perpetrators of this terrorist attack. It was a grievous, grievous attack. Um, but I think uh, our experience after 9-11 is actually um, instructive here, right? I mean, we had, we took a second. 
We did a bombing campaign in Afghanistan and began over a decades-long hunt for the perpetrators of this attack. Um, we also went ahead and occupied Afghanistan and invaded and occupied Iraq. And I think if you ask most Americans, in hindsight, they would have said, hey, you know, a bombing campaign going after the perpetrators, that's one option that, that made a, may, might have made more sense, as opposed to 20 years of war. So I think that, that for those of us who have served in places like Fallujah <laughs> and Ramadi, we just want to make sure that there's an end game that's not um, that's not fantasy, that's actually real. We want to make sure that you don't create more terrorists by the way that you act. And we want to make sure that we get the people who perpetrated this attack. And you can want all those things all at the same time. And sometimes being right. a good ally and a good partner is telling those hard lessons from our own experience.